Sam, and good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you today. My name is Tim, and we're going to spend a bit of time uh, thinking about Psalm 84 together. Before we do, uh, one of the common questions that I've received over the last couple of weeks, sort of through the Christmas, the New Year period, has gone to the effect of this. So, Tim, uh, what are your hopes for 2023? Or a variation of that is normally, so Tim, now what's the next chapter in the life of Grey City? And to be honest, most people are just sort of making polite conversation, and I've certainly appreciated that. Uh, but what's interesting is I've noticed that there's been a common assumption in all of the questions, and that is the thread that runs through them is the idea that, that a year or a life well lived will be a year or a life that is heading in a certain direction. And so the assumption is that if I or if you want to get the most out of your 2023, then you, you can't just sit back and allow yourself, so to speak, to be swept along by the winds of time. Instead, you actually need to be intentional. You need to think it through. You need, to the extent that you can, you need to seek to grow. You need to seek to move your life in a certain direction. Right? That's why the question is asked, what does 2023 hold for you? Where are you going? It's also why uh, people around this time of year will often set goals. Uh, maybe you're one of those people. Maybe you've written them down. Maybe you haven't written them down, but you, you have a, a clear hope, a clear idea of where you would love your life to, to look like or to, to go, to end up by the end of this year. Now, if that is you, um, you say, I think that is, a, in general, a, a great activity to give yourself to, to set goals, to, to plan, uh, I do think COVID has helped us somewhat to be a little more humble in our plans, don't you? Uh, such that we now really do need to say, hey, if the Lord wills, and with the spirit of humility, knowing that the Lord determines our steps, I think it's a good thing to make goals, to, to have plans, uh, as a way of really seeking to get the most out of the short time that God has given us on this earth. Now, the reason I bring all that up is that I think today's Psalm, Psalm 84, is actually going to set a really helpful context within which we can consider the goals, the plans of, of the one year. I say that because what it does is invite us to step back and actually consider the direction, the destination of our lives more generally. Where are we going? Where, where is life headed? See, Psalm 84 is a psalm that meditates on and, and ponders the beauty and the blessing of dwelling in the presence of God and the beauty and the blessing that God has in store for His people who make that the journey of their lives, whose life is one of spiritual pilgrimage towards their heavenly home. Now, I say all that, but as we read through Psalm 84, as Sam read it, as, uh, Sam read it for us before, you may have thought, mm, I, that's maybe not just as obvious. You see, as you read through, the psalmist will use language like, you know, God's dwelling place in Zion. So just to uh, draw your attention to it, um, Psalm begins, 84 verse 1, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. And then speaking of those who make it their journey to go there, he writes, they go in verse 7, from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Now, when the psalm was first written, the author here would have been speaking about the earthly temple, which was in Jerusalem. Uh, the earthly temple was where God manifested His presence among His people. And Zion is just another word for Jerusalem, again, which is where the temple was built. And so in the original context, this really is a psalm about the beauty of God's earthly temple and the longing, the desire, the strong yearning of this particular psalmist uh, to travel to the temple and to dwell in the presence of the living God. The thing is, uh, as the Bible story unfolds, you start to see that words like temple, words like Zion, words like dwelling place, th there's more to them than meets the eye. Uh, there, there, there is a meaning, a meaning or a, a richness to these terms beneath the surface, such that by the time you get to the New Testament, you actually learn, oh, wow, you know, the earthly temple, the earthly Jerusalem, they were just shadows of a much richer, a, a much greater treasure that God has in store for His people. 
Um, now, there's a few levels of fulfillment on that theme. So you start with Jesus, you get it in the church, but really it, it, it's climactic fulfillment comes in the new uh, creation. And so, you know, we're in Psalms, but if, if you scroll all the way forward to the end of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, second last chapter, uh, chapter 21, it's a, a chapter that many Christians love. You probably know it very well if you're familiar with the Bible, but it, it speaks about Zion as this heavenly city. A holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It says, God will dwell amongst his people. And we're told there's no temple needed because God and the Lamb are its temple. So again, in in the original context, this is primarily a psalm about the beauty of the earthly temple. But as time went by, the deeper... And the truer meaning behind the psalm becomes more apparent. You see, psalms aren't static and lifeless words. Yeah, they're in a book. But this is not a static and lifeless book. Uh, The words of the psalm, as with the words of all the scriptures, have two authors. There's both a human and a divine author. And so these words are living and active. What that means is that By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, each of the Psalms have what we might call uh, multiple horizons of fulfillment embedded within them, such that the people of God, at whatever age they're in, whether it's with the psalmist when it's written, whether it's with them later on, whether it's with us today, we can pick up the Psalms, as we'll do today, and use it as a a song, as a prayer, uh, to give voice to our own. Uh, emotions and uh, truths in our own context. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we work through today's psalm, because what we're going to need to do is, if I can put it this way, jump between horizons um, to get the richness and the fullness of this psalm. So at times, we will sit with the original author, you know, this unnamed son of Korah, uh, most likely living during the reign of King Solomon, uh, just after the year 1000 BC, so maybe 950 BC, sometime around then, as he considers the little birds, you know, the sparrows and the swallows, uh, making their nests in the temple. Uh, other times we'll sit with God's people as they're in exile. They're in Babylon. Uh, Jerusalem has been laid waste. There's no temple anymore. And they're praying, God, would you look with favour on your anointed, your Messiah? Would you send your king to rule on David's throne? Uh, At other times, we'll sit with the likes of John Newton, that famous slave trader turned hymn writer and consider the majestic glories of our heavenly home. You may know the famous song. Glorious things of you are spoken, Zion city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken, formed you for his own abode. And later on, fading are the world's vain pleasures, all their boasted pomp and show. Solid joys and lasting treasures, none but Zion's children know. You may or may not have set goals for your year this year. Um, But if you're a believer in Jesus, Zion is your heavenly home. It's where you're headed. It's what this psalm is all about. And so together, I want us to go and explore the psalm and and seek to enjoy and dig up the riches as we consider the blessings of dwelling with God. As we do that, uh, we're going to take the psalm, we're going to break it up into three parts. The Hebrew word blessing appears three times in our psalm. We're going to break it up roughly according to the usage of that word. It appears once in verse 3, once in verse 4, sorry, once in verse 5, and then again in verse 12. So we'll kind of break it up into three different parts, all thinking about the blessing. So let's jump in. If you've got a Bible, get it open with you. I want to... Look, I... This is off script. Um, uh, COVID... Um, that was when I first started using the slides, the Bible verses on the screens. I noticed what happened when we started to do that. It's a wonderful experience for people at home, but what it means is that no one brings their Bible anymore. And I I know I've got them all here for you on the screen, but Ellie, get your phone out or something. 
I, maybe I'll get off this hobby horse as the weeks go on, but I, I've been thinking about it the last week or last couple of months, I should say, and going, let's let 2023 be a year where we actually have a church that opens our Bibles and looks at it. Back on script, all right. The blessing of dwelling with God. Number one, the blessing of dwelling with God. So the psalmist is going to begin with an unabashed and almost, if I can put it this way, risque uh, outburst describing his longing and his desire to dwell in the presence of God. Take a look. Psalm 84, verse 1 and 2. It says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, it even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart, my flesh cry out for the living God. Now, it may seem a little odd to us. Perhaps you, you might not even be able to notice it in there, but the psalmist is using the language of love poetry. And so uh, if a groom spoke of his bride the way that the psalmist is speaking of God in his temple, we'd tell him to get a room. Uh, I, I, try, I try to communicate. It is dripping with intense desire and longing for intimacy. So this word lovely, uh, that, is, that is less a word describing the objective beauty of God's dwelling place and more uh, the psalmist's feelings about the dwelling place. It is his beloved. He loves it so much. Um, but lest we think that he's just obsessed with the place, uh, he, he makes sure we know it's actually about the person in the place. And so he says, my soul, my heart, my flesh, they, every fiber of his being is crying out, is longing for the one who dwells there. He has a longing for the living God. Now, it could be that kind of language makes you feel maybe a little uncomfortable. Or at least you, you kind of just can't help but wonder, well, isn't that kind of language, isn't it too familiar? Isn't it, it's a little too base, a little too common to describe communion with the living God? After all, uh, surely God is the, the powerful, the glorious, the, the holy, uh, the all-wise creator of the universe that we are supposed to humbly submit to and serve. I want to say yes, that all of that is true. But it is fascinating, isn't it, and perhaps even a little shocking, that the Scriptures, they don't let us stay there. They're always pushing us and nudging us in the direction of intimacy and relationship. And so just as an example, consider the picture that God uses to describe the relationship between Christ and the church. What is it? You can tell me. Bride and groom, husband and wife, it's a marriage. In other words, like you, you get to Revelation 21 and that heavenly city that we were describing before is described as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And so the picture we're getting is that God's desire for eternity is not sort of some arm's length relationship, it's not some heavenly cohabitation, it's a marriage with all the relationship and intimacy that a marriage has. Uh, expanding on this idea, Christopher Watkin writes this. He says, The greatest joy of which the human heart is capable, as well as the deepest fulfillment for which it was made, is to dwell in perfect relationship with the God of perfect relationships. Grace City, you were made to dwell in perfect relationship with the living God. And what that means is that even the greatest desire, the deepest infatuation that a bride might, sorry, that a groom might have for his bride on their wedding day, is really just a shadow. It's just an echo, first and foremost, of the longing that Christ has for his bride, the church. But then also that our souls in turn were made to have for him. Now, for some of us, uh, our conscience will be so seared that the idea of longing for intimacy with God will seem ridiculous, maybe even laughable. Uh, but not for all. Uh, for some, including the author of this psalm, he knows it's what he's made for. 
And so he says, all I want, my deepest desire, my heart, my flesh cry out for the living God. He just wants to dwell in his courts. Challenge for him is that's not where he was. <laughs> he's not in Jerusalem, in the temple. And we know that because as he's going to go on in the psalm, he's going to describe his desire to make a pilgrimage, his desire to journey to the temple. But that's not where he is. And so he's longing to be in relationship or in deep intimacy in the fellowship, in, in the presence of God is not yet fulfilled. So what does he do? Well, uh, like a young man or, or woman who might uh, enviously uh, consider anyone or anyone, anything that has access to a distant beloved in a, dis, in a foreign land. He, he turns his attention to consider those who can at that moment experience what he at the present only longs for. The birds, the sparrows, the swallows. And so he keeps going, verse 3. He says, even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. And the temple in Jerusalem was this enormous structure made of stone, uh, multiple pylons, lots of overhangs. And so you can imagine, uh, you know, the birds would have a field day making their nests in there. And, and so he imagines the sparrows or the swallows making nests for themselves in the crags and the clefts of the stone to raise their young. Or he imagines them in their tweeting, and the melody of their singing as they're rejoicing in the safety and the shelter of dwelling in God's temple. There's a part of the psalmist that wants to be like one of the birds. He, he wants the privilege of what they have, actually getting to spend their lives dwelling in God's house, singing His praises all their days. And so he finishes this first stanza, the first part of the psalm with verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, they are ever praising you. Uh, blessed are they indeed. Now, uh, he's going to go on and, and explore the unfathomable blessings that are available to those who dwell in God's house, such that he will say, you know, it's better to spend, a, a better is one day in your courts and a thousand elsewhere. Um, but they come at the end, so we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, before he does that, though, he turns his attention to the blessings of the journey. The blessings of the journey. So we've done, you know, point one, the blessings of dwelling with God. Now, the blessings of dwelling towards God. Because as we've seen in our first little stanza, there are incredible blessings of dwelling in the presence of God for those fortunate enough to do so. The challenge for us, however, is that we're not there yet. Now, if you trust in Christ... Uh, that will be your heavenly home, but it's not yet, at least not fully. Uh, the good news of this second little stanza is that there are also incredible blessings for those of us who live our lives now as a pilgrimage towards that heavenly home and the God who dwells there. So verse 5 says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Now, that last little word or line, that you know, hearts are set on pilgrimage, it's an interesting little one. Uh, literally, it says, in whose hearts are the highways. That's all it says. In whose hearts are the highways. Uh, the ESV renders it, in whose heart are the highways to Zion, because the highways it's referring to really are just, just the roads that someone would travel up on their way to Jerusalem, up Mount Zion, to the temple. And so it really becomes the highways of pilgrimage for the hundreds, the thousands of Jews every year who would travel up that route for one of the annual festivals at the temple. Now, it's, it's not entirely clear whether the author is speaking of someone who's actually planned their pilgrimage, planned their trip, or whether he's almost imagining them taking that trip in their heart, you know, the highways of the heart. Uh, maybe they're actually, it's, it's more of a spiritual pilgrimage as they're going on the journey, imagining the trip up to the temple. Maybe they have to content themselves with just playing that journey out in their mind. Uh, what is clear, though, either way, is that there's incredible blessings to be found in the journey. So what is the blessing, or what blessings are available? Well, uh, he explores one blessing 
by playing with the name of one of the key landmarks that you would pass through on your journey up to the temple. And so we see this in verse 6. He says, As they pass through the valley of Bacar, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Now, we don't know the exact location of the valley of Bacar, but the word Bacar sounds like the Hebrew word for weeping or sadness. And so it's the valley of weeping. It's the valley of sadness. But what is clear from the context is that it's also a place that's dry and lifeless, which is why what he says is so fascinating. Because did you notice, in this lifeless and dry valley, what does the pilgrimager the pilgrim, what do they do? They make it a place of springs. They turn the valley of dryness and weeping into a place of springs. Christopher Ash, who's a Bible commentator, uh, writes this about that line. He says, this is a poetic way of saying that when someone whose heart is filled with love for Zion travels through the dry and lifeless valleys, he or she makes that very tough and sad place into one of life-giving waters. A place and time that is simply, sorry, is in its very nature hostile to life will be turned into a place where there is life simply because walking through it is someone in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Some of you know that from experience. Uh, by faith, you've dared to dig up blessing in the midst of hardship. If I can borrow language from Psalm 23, you've turned the valley of the shadow of death into green pastures for your soul. And by the grace and mercy of God, the valley of Bacar has become the valley of blessing. Not a valley of weeping, but a valley of blessing. That is some of the blessings that are available to those who fix their hearts on the highway to the heavenly Jerusalem. Who fix their heart on the road to Zion and say, that's where I'm headed. Uh, for those, the valley of weeping can become the valley of blessing. In verse 7, the psalmist actually goes on to say, you know, for those people, uh, they go not from weakness to weakness. Now, as you're climbing up the hill to the literal temple, you can imagine you know, every step is getting more and more tired. He says, no, 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 people who make their pilgrimage to Zion... They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Now, outwardly, those who travel the pilgrim's way fade away. And maybe from old age or illness, maybe you feel that now. The decay in your bones has already set in. You feel it. Maybe they're persecuted. Maybe they're crushed by the miseries of sin and its consequences in a broken world. You know, sin has consequences. There is forgiveness available for those who trust in Christ, but sin still has consequences. Maybe you're living through some of that and you're just getting crushed by it. You hate what's happened. You hate maybe what you've done. and You, you feel like you're fading away. Those on the pilgrim's way outwardly may fade away, but inwardly, those whose hearts are set on Zion are renewed day by day. As the Apostle Paul says, uh, we are being transformed from one degree of glory to the other as we consider with unveiled faces the Lord. Grace City, these are the blessings of traveling the pilgrim's way towards our heavenly home. And so we knew and we sing. See the streams of living waters springing from eternal love. Well, supply your sons and daughters, and all fear of want remove. Who can faint while such a river ever will their thirst assuage? Grace which light the Lord, the giver, never fails from age to age. There's blessing when we get there. There's blessings on the journey. But there's also blessing in trusting in God. And this is the third and final thing I want to explore together. The blessing of trusting in God. 
As we come to this third and final section, uh, it does admittedly start with a, a seemingly random, almost parenthetical, like you want to put it in brackets, prayer, uh, that God would look with favor on his anointed king. Look at with me, verse 9. It starts in verse 8. We'll just start in verse 9. It says, Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Now, I read that a couple of times during the week. I, I couldn't quite figure out what it was saying. Like, who is the shield? Is God the shield? Uh, and then I realized, oh, it's in parallelism. And so, our shield is paralleled with and therefore equal to your anointed one. And so the shield of the people is the anointed of the Lord. That's the connection. Now that word anointed, down the bottom there, is Moshiach in Hebrew. Uh, it's where we get our English word Messiah and the Greek equivalent, Christos, is where we get Christ. And so it's a prayer, effectively, that God would look with favor on his Messiah, uh, the anointed king who's going to come in David's line. Now, when the psalm was first written, Israel most likely had a literal king, a physical king, in David's line, sitting on David's throne. Again, very possibly King Solomon. We don't know, but at least one of those guys. And so you could imagine, in its first context, as the people sang this song or hummed it as their way, on their way up the mountain to pilgrimage at, for one of the festivals, this is effectively a prayer that God would bless their king. The thing is, uh, the people kept singing this song throughout the generations. Uh, and so they would have sung this song in exile in Babylon. Again, Jerusalem lies in tatters. There is no temple. And so they're singing this song, saying, God, would you look with favor on your anointed? Would you send this promised Messiah to sit on David's throne? They sing it after they get back from Israel, sorry, from Babylon. So they're in Jerusalem and they've got some kings, but they're not in David's line. And so again, they're saying, God, would you look with favor on your anointed, the king who's going to sit on David's throne? In other words, as time goes by, it becomes clearer and clearer that this song has multiple levels of meaning. And they're longing for a future king, a, a king upon whom God's favor would rest and through whom the blessings of dwelling in Zion and pilgrimage to Zion would finally be realized. Uh, if you know your Bibles or you've been around church for a while, you'll know the promise of the new... Or the declaration of the New Testament is that that promise was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But how does that help us? How does that help us make sense of the psalm? Well, I want to say, let, let's keep going because I think it's going to become clearer as we go through. So Psalm verse 10, uh, the psalmist declares, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. If you know the Matt Redman song, I'm not going to sing it, but it is a good song. Better is one. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. A time warps in the presence of God. Now, last week, uh, Charles working through, was it Psalm 90? I think it was. He said, um, a thousand years for us is like a day with God. And now we learn that one day with God is better than a thousand elsewhere. Time warps. Now, again, the psalmist has the earthly temple in mind, I think, when he's writing this psalm. So, again, he doesn't live in Jerusalem. He gets a couple days in the presence of God as he travels to the temple to uh, enjoy one of the festivals. But consider the ultimate horizon of the psalm. Uh, consider the blessing on offer to those of us who actually get to experience the heavenly Zion. If one day in God's presence is better than a thousand elsewhere, what's eternity like? Another one of John Newton's hymns, I won't sing it for you. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. Days upon days upon days of blessing. Bring it on. The thing is, if we're going to take the psalm seriously, that is, not just sort of skirt over certain words and fudge its meaning a little bit, which I think we're often tempted to do when we read the Bible. 
verse 11 presents a little bit of a problem for us. Because have a look at it with me. It says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Now, if you're among us as one whose walk is blameless, you probably won't see a problem there. Uh, but for the rest of us, and might I suggest those of us with a more realistic assessment of ourselves, the promise of favour, honour and no good thing being withheld from us seems to be conditional upon us meeting a standard which all of us have fallen short of. Because who among us here could be claimed to be blameless? Oh, sure, uh, some of us, I'm certain, are more loving, kind and servant-hearted than others. But blameless, I don't think so. And therefore, again, if we're actually going to read the psalm properly and not just fudge it a little bit, what does begin as this beautiful, hope-filled psalm sort of ends with a tease. Because it would seem that the favour and honour that we long for, we're not only unworthy of, it's also out of our reach. Now, if you've been around church for a while, there'll be something in you going, that can't, I, I know that's not right. Uh, after all, you know, the, the hymn writers like John Newton, uh, when they sing of Zion, that they, there's an expectation that humans are there also participating in the praises of God. It's not like just God and his angels, like others are there. But why? Why? Is it because blameless doesn't really mean blameless? Maybe that's it. You know, so, for example, blameless doesn't mean like have never sinned. It just means doesn't do the big sins. And so, you know, as long as you keep yourselves from uh, murder, theft and the other big things, you, you should be okay. Or is it because God realized blameless was sort of unrealistic? And so originally it was blameless, then he realized heaven would be empty. And so he sort of lowers the bar, or at least he has compassion on us and blesses us anyway. Now, I doubt any of us would put it quite like that. But it is often how people think. I think it's how we, we fudge around bits of the Bible that say it's only for the blameless. The problem is, well, so we either self-righteously assume we're good enough to meet God's standards or we assume God graciously overlooks His standards and blesses anyway, us anyway. Uh, the problem with that is that neither does justice to the biblical God because the first uh, makes a mockery of His righteousness and the second cheapens His grace. So it can't be either of those. So how are we to make sense of it? If these blessings are only available for the blameless, why isn't heaven empty? Why isn't Zion empty? Well, it's because ultimately God answered the prayer of verse 9. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favour on your anointed one. There was a time where God really did look with favour on his anointed one, his Messiah. Because uh, there was one, one man whose way of life was blameless. Uh, he wasn't just a doorkeeper in the house of God, he was a son. And yet he left Zion to save people like you and I from the tents of the wicked. See, at the cross, Jesus Christ offered his blameless life to become our shield. And therefore, not only did God bestow upon him favor and honor and not withhold from him any good thing, like a good king, he invites his people in to share in those blessings. See, Grace City, only the gospel does justice to the biblical God and actually helps you to read the Bible properly. Because in the life of Jesus, perfect righteousness of God is on display. That's the standard that we're supposed to live up to. That's what blamelessness looks like. But all of us have fallen short. And so in the death of Jesus, that's where you see the immeasurable cost of God's grace. He couldn't just sweep our sins under the carpet. He couldn't just lower the standards. No, so he dealt with our sin 
in the death of his blameless son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So where does that leave us? Well, the psalmist in verse 12 says, Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. At the end of the day, that is your only hope. It's my only hope. Because yes, all of these blessings are available. The blessings of dwelling with God, the blessings that are available on the journey towards God, but only for those, not because we've earned it through our blameless lives, but because we trust in God and His blameless Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as this psalm reminds us, chief among them is the blessing of coming face to face with God. And so let me close uh, with the words of a hymn which I will not sing by Carrie E. Breck. It says, face to face with Christ my Saviour, face to face what will it be when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Only faintly now I see him with a darkling veil between, but a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen. What rejoicing in his presence when a banished grief and pain, when the crooked ways are straightened and the dark things shall be plain. Face to face, O blissful moment, face to face to see and know, face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ who loves me so. You may not have written down your plans for this year. You may not have dreams for what this year holds for you, but if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that's what eternity holds for you. And so the way to get the best out of this year, to make the most of this year, is to live your life, to ensure you can do everything you can to make each day this year as a step on your pilgrimage towards your heavenly home. Why don't you join me and let's pray together. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful psalm and the way that it just has uh, so much richness and has had so much richness throughout the generations. We thank you for the blessing that is available through dwelling in your courts and we long, Lord, we long for the day when we can dwell with you for all eternity. Until then... Sustain us, help us to go from strength to strength in the power of your spirit. Would you transform us from one degree of glory to another? Help us to turn the valley of weeping into the valley of blessing, trusting that you and you alone are all we need. Until that final day, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.